in a bubble or not, but we're so far from that. I just think that Soros, it was semantics. So I, I'm not too concerned about what George said. Rubini, I think, is just angling for a job in the U.S. administration somewhere, so he's got to talk down gold. Most guys have an agenda when they're talking that up or talking it down in that instance. You also had this to say in that speech, quote, there is indeed more coverage recently because of the relentless price rise, but it tends to be skeptical with the bearish commentators continuing to get the most exposure despite having been continuously wrong. There is no better example of this than an individual who my compliance department would prefer that I not identify. However, I'll give you a broad hint. He writes virtually daily for a noted Canadian gold Internet site, dubbed the Tokyo Rose of gold commentators. He is always quoted in articles with a negative slant, despite having been consistently wrong since the inception of gold's bull market. In my opinion, as long as he gets any press at all, we are a long way from the end of this bull market in gold, end quote. So that I understand this, as long as John Nadler keeps getting press, it is reasonable. You said it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is reasonable to assume all is well if that's the case. Well, you know, I think that's one of the things, I guess, that sticks in my craw more than anything. I have an enormous regard for my good friends at GATA, and they're not allowed to ever be mentioned in the North American press. And yet everybody who's been dead, and GATA's been dead right for the last nine, ten years. And all these guys that have been wrong consistently are continually trotted out saying the same junk that they said $300 ago, and they're going to be equally as wrong. And so I just find the whole thing nauseating, actually. From your Investor Digest article, from just a few days ago. Quote, what I find vaguely amusing in this instance is that if one were to deconstruct the U.S. state by state and then examine the condition of California, Michigan, and New York, to name but three, the problems of Europe's weak sisters would seem almost trivial in comparison, end quote. JSMindset.com, Jim Sinclair has been talking quite a bit about the number of states in the United States that are in trouble and could face bankruptcy. You're bringing it up here. When you look inside the United States, John, is that just one more contributing factor that will cause the Fed to print money, that will cause this hyperinflation to hit us? Oh, unquestionably. Like, I really don't know what they're going to do with the states if the feds don't come and bail them out. I mean, you just can't keep raising taxes and cutting services because that's actually driving economic activity further down. So, yeah, I think that's an, another factor that sort of isn't probably getting the amount of airtime it deserves. I mean, a lot of these states are in really critical condition. It's, it's horrifying, in my opinion. You also said, quote, I think it is important to remember that bull markets continuously climb a wall of worry and then experience violent corrections, which serve to clean out the nervous Nellies, the latecomers and the momentum investors. Gold has once again experienced just such a phenomenon, and I think it is the precursor to yet another strong up leg in the year, end quote. John, what's interesting to me is this, and you were trying to highlight this in the article. That's a feeling I got anyway, but when the gold bull market of the 70s emanated, gold was up six out of the gate very quickly, right? And then we had the pullback. Well, Volcker said one of the mistakes we made was that we didn't intervene early enough in the gold market of the 70s, right? When we were trying to take the currency down, we let gold get away from it. Right. And so this time they've been intervening from the get-go all the way through. And so you're pointing out that, look, even though we're nine years in a row up, we're barely over a quadruple. So it really isn't the bubble that people are making it out to be. Oh, it's the opposite. I mean, the fact is that basically if there had been no intervention, I would think the gold price, that just to pick a number, would be at least twice where it is today. So the, it's the antithesis of a bubble. I mean, I, I find it laughable when people trot this out even as an argument because it can be shot down so easily. Let me ask you, I don't think you're much of a technician, John, because you and Eric over there are fundamentalists, at least as long as I've known. Yeah, you'll use some charts, but I just mean in general, you're doing your case based more on being a fundamentalist. Absolutely. But I will always look at charts just to, because sometimes they'll give you a hint. You better look at your fundamentals closer enough. But if I had to choose between, if, I, if I'm pretty comfortable with my fundamentals, they take precedence over charts. I want to address this for the people out there that look at charts because a lot of times they'll get sucked in. And I know you probably remember this, John, but they were talking about head and shoulders patterns in the Huey and we were going to go down and we broke the neckline. Everything were just reversed up, took out the head, and we went to the upside. So what I'm saying is, is it a mistake 
for some of these less experienced players to be relying so much on charts in a market that is so rigged, as Gatta would say? Absolutely, because I, I believe that the boys on the other side, who I actually have an enormous respect for because they're good at what they do, I mean, they know perfectly well where the chart pattern breaks down. And, I mean, they create the charts very often. And so often when something looks, looks like it's breaking out, they get everybody sucked in on the upside before they take it down. So I think long-term charts in gold are fine, but the short-term charts, I think, are treacherous. And calling sort of short-term breakdowns and that, I think, or breakouts are very injurious to your wealth. Let me ask you this, John, in closing, because you were there, right? So you remember that manic phase, which was almost unimaginable, I think, to some folks at the time as it was taking place. Can you talk about that? Because you were there and you were literally living it at the time. What was that like for you? Well, people don't realize, I mean, the gold market went from sort of $35, but it was just, it, it wasn't much over $200, $300 near the very end of the bull market. And the, and the last run was like, took place in months. And it was like, it's hard to describe gold fever when it gets out of control. I mean, all I can remember is that lineup at the Bank of Nova Scotia around the block for people trying to buy physical gold within, you know, days of the top. We're so far from that, as I said jokingly in one of my write-ups, the only lineups you ever see now are people going to these parties to sell their gold to these shysters that are buying their jewelry off them. Right. So, I mean, it's the antithesis of a gold fever. I mean, heck, most people, I really don't believe that the average citizen doesn't know anything about it. Some of my friends still scoff at me. Let me just say this in closing or get this from you, John. Because it seems like you're innuendoing this in your writings. You went through the 70s, you went through that, and it seems to me what you're trying to say to people or warn to them here is this mania, this time, will be of a much greater scale than what we saw before. It will be worldwide, and it will literally and utterly completely be a panic. I believe that. What I try to do at this point is just interest people in the opportunity. And if you make too big a sort of statement, it kind of turns people off because they just can't, they can't grasp the magnitude of it. If I tell somebody it's going to $1,500 this year, you can probably, that's defensible. But if I say to somebody who isn't a gold player that it's going to 6000 or 10000 or whatever number you want to choose, they're just going to look at me like I'm nuts and click, and that'll be, the, they, they won't pay any attention. I mean, first you've got to get their interest because it's important that they understand the opportunity. But to me, you go in stair steps, but I think that this thing is, as I said somewhere, that it's thousands of dollars in many years from the ultimate top. John, Jim Rickards was on recently, as you know, and he was talking about the buy overhang in the market, right? The fact that the Indian, Chinese, and Russian central banks are looking to get 3,000 tons in the case of China, 1,000 for India, they picked up 200 of that, and then another 1,000 for the Russian central bank. But this is at a time when the Europeans have stopped selling. So my question for you, John, is where is the gold going to come from? Well, I mean, I don't know where it's going to come from. The only way it's going to be drawn out is by dramatically higher prices. And for the longest time, the, the sell side has predominated in the physical market because the central banks were prepared to supply whatever was required. But I think their vaults have rapidly become close to empty, at least for the amount any more they want to get rid of, just at the very same time that there's massive new buyers in the, in the government sphere, and you cited them, Russia, India, China, etc., so to me, this is an inflection point that guarantees dramatically higher prices than the gold price. It's just a matter of time, and uh, I don't think there's that much time left. You said to me off the air, we're just in the final death throes of the paper manipulators playing games with the gold price. When you see commentators talking about the end of the world and the collapse and the fall of gold to six, $700, as a fundamentalist, do you kind of laugh at that a little bit? Yeah, I, th I think they're talking their book, and I mean, people have a tendency to do that. Basically, if they're if they're short, they're going to be have a terribly negative story. And I, that fellow Nadler, whose name came up earlier, I mean, he works for a firm that I believe markets and has some gold product that may not have all the gold backing that it purports to have. I mean, he may have a vested interest in saying what he says. Okay, so John, in closing here, where should people go? I know in Canada, everybody knows about Sprott or becoming aware of Sprott, and you have more money kind of migrating over there because Eric has been so right in his writings for so long. I mean, we're talking over a decade. Your writings have been great, very consistent, very correct. Do people just go to Sprott.com? How do they do this? 
Yeah, they can just access our website. I mean, there's a real fount of information there, and I, I think uh, if they want to educate themselves on the sort of our thoughts, but then I think that we've been pretty good through the like, certainly through the last decade. It's all there, and you can and the, all the history's there, so you can read it and bone up on it. Well, thank you so much for joining us, John. I greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to talk, and we have to do it more often, Eric. Six years is too long. It was time for John Embry. What can I tell you? Well, I'm delighted, and if if you have that feeling again, I'd be delighted to come on. Thank you, sir. All right. Great to chat here. Thank you for joining us at kingworldnews.com. Be sure to tune in next week where we will have the legendary Mr. Gold, Jim Sinclair, as well as other interviews with the top people in the world.